The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Let's have a word of prayer and let's get in and take a look at what does it mean to be called of God <clears throat> under the new covenant. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest for those who are visiting with us in assembly by internet. We expect the same classroom etiquette. And so we, what is classroom etiquette? Well, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. And that means that the Holy Spirit is in you. To teach you the word of God, he's called the spirit of truth. But he can't do it if you're carnal. Can't do it if you're carnal. Evidence of carnality in your Christian life is that you have personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. They must be confessed in silence and privacy prior to study. Okay? First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. So let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you that these that have come our way tonight understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit, at least in preview. At the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside the body of a new covenant believer, church age. And he's there to guide us and teach us and train us and recall doctrine and just a multiple of things. He's there to control us, our flesh and direct our spirit under, under his ministry and guidance. Thankful, Father, that the work of Christ on the cross has extended the Christian life by confession of sin that brings us back into fellowship and the operation of spirituality in our life. I pray, Father, that exercise tonight so that we can study the word of God and figure out what does it mean to be called of God and how is it that every believer under the new covenant is called of God. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most phenomenal things about this, this premise, this doctrinal premise in verse 15 is that every church age believer, because he lives under the new covenant, has been called of God. You've been called of God. You know, you, a lot of times, this may be everywhere, I don't know, because I wasn't a believer when I was everywhere. I was only a believer when I came to the South. I became a born-again person. But I can remember in my early days of Christianity in the South, where nobody talked about everybody being called, but they did talk about certain people being called. And when, uh, when I felt like maybe, at least in my early days of my Christian life, I just wanted to do more things for God. I wanted to be involved in ministry. They immediately identified that, and maybe they were right, but they identified that as being having a calling from God. You have a calling from God. Um, so I took that kind of serious. And then w what do I do with that? Well, then, you know, well, you need to go get prepared, go to seminary and, you know, then get into ministry and all that. Um, but and so I just thought those who were called to, had a calling in their life, those who were called of God were we're for ministry, we're kind of unique and different. But the fact is that everybody is called of God. Everybody. It's one of the 50, it's one of the 50 things you receive. It's one of the 20 status privileges. When you look at the, the pamphlet, the 50 things, you will know that. And in this passage, verse 15, they tell you that, 14 and 15, they tell you very clearly that this is an, in, under the new covenant, everybody, and, and listen, we're, we're so unique, aren't we, in the new covenant? Every person is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Uh, 
And as a result of that, the presence of the third member of the Godhead, there's a whole lot of things that everybody has that we used to think only certain people had in the Old Covenant, right? So it makes us kind of unique. Uh, uh, and the writer of Hebrews teaching in this subject matter, he's teaching on the superiority of the new covenant blood of Jesus Christ. And when we, we talk about the new covenant blood of Christ, we're talking about historical Christology as opposed to the blood of sacrificial animals, which we call shadow Christology. And, and what's interesting about this? Now, pay, pay attention because the word called is going to be important. We're all called of God. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the, the blood of sacrificial animals pointed towards the coming of Christ. They, they did it year after year. Every year they had to go and recommit themselves to this idea. And um, that Christ was coming. He hasn't come yet. But when he comes, it issues in a whole new day. Now, they didn't understand that that new, whole new day would first, be would first involve the church age. They thought that new day would involve the millennial age, we, that they, when he came, he would establish his kingdom, and boom, there would be. And so they struggled with that whole idea, didn't they? Even his disciples struggled with that whole idea when he did not do that. We're, we're, but you're not establishing your kingdom, right? And uh, so, but this is how they viewed that. And so under the new covenant, the teaching of the new covenant, let, let, let me compare to what they were doing compared to what we're doing. Under, under the old covenant, the believer, every year, he, he offered sacrifices. You know, once a year, the, the great atonement. And in between that, they had sacrifices uh, for different reasons, right? The seven holidays, national holidays. They offered it once as a reminder that Christ had not come yet. The kingdom was not established yet, but when he came, it would be, right? So they were looking to what we call the first coming, which they didn't know there was going to be a first and second coming because what sets between the first coming and second coming of Christ, what sets there? The church, the mystery of the church. So everybody was looking for the coming of Christ. Agreed? Here's what we do. When we do a very similar thing under the new covenant because every time we take the Eucharist, which is, for us, it's monthly, right, as often as you do it. What do we look for in the Eucharist? Right after we take the bread and take the cup, the very next verse, verse 26, tells us, uh, looking for his return, right? So you see, we do something very similar looking to the second coming of Christ, which they did, believers did in the Old Testament, looking for what we would call the first coming. Are you with me? And so a lot of times when people read the head duty of year, they thought that if you got lost in between that year, you were in deep trouble and you had to be saved again. So some people make that mistake. That's not true any more than we take the Eucharist, right? I mean, we take it because we are saved. It's, not based, it's based on our salvation position. And, and that's one of the important things of not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Do you understand that? Yes. Well, anyhow, uh, so to kind of give you an, a, a comparison of what they were doing under the old covenant and what we're doing under the new covenant, there's a lot of similarity and yet a lot of differences, okay? But I just wanted to make that point. In today's lesson text, which is <laughs> Hebrews 9, 14 and 15, in today's lesson text, he is teaching on the superiority of the calling of God of new covenant believers, new covenant believers over old covenant believers. In other words, he's saying, why would you ever want to go back to the old covenant looking for Christ when he's already come? I mean, that's, that's just, that, it doesn't make sense and it shouldn't. And so, that's a, so pay, pay, when, when, when we opened up our passage, which was uh, verse 14, I said to you when we read it, pay attention to how much more. Okay. And that's a, that's a way of talking about the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant, which is really the subject matter of the entire book of, of Hebrews, but especially here. Um, 
So you want to pay attention to verse 14, what it says, how much more? I mean, e- even in our common terms, that's a kind of, when somebody says, well, how much more? I mean, even, even that means a lot to us, doesn't it? I mean, it's like, you mean there's more? Man, how much more? And so he, and he's going to tell you how much more. And that's what chapter 8, 9, and 10 is about. How much more? How much more superior <laughs> is the new covenant to the old covenant? And so by this little phrase, he's pushing on the subject matter of the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. In my lesson tonight, because I have just an hour to do this, I want to look at four aspects of the superiority of the called of God under the new covenant as opposed to the old covenant. The first thing that's of of great interest to people that like etymology of Hebrew and Greek words because this one, if this, we, have, we have a word for called in the Hebrew, and we have one for in the Greek. And what's interesting, they both mean called, but they have different slants on the idea. And that's important to us, at least for a guy like me. The etymology of the Hebrew and Greek words for the, for the word called under point one gives insight into the theology of called of God. The Hebrew and Greek word. For example, in the Hebrew, the word is kara. It's Q-A-R-A. I put it on your paper for you. Kara. It places emphasis on the content. When you find this in the Hebrew, it places emphasis on the content of the message of an invitational call. And that'll be really important for us. What a pretty one that is. It's not Dixie, but it's okay. Um, so here, here's what this word has interest in. If, if you got a, if, let's say you were at home and got a call, right, on your phone, got a call, and it, it, Jane always takes the calls at home, so she would say, uh, somebody called for you. I would say, well, who called? Who called? And what's he say? What did he say? That's Kara. Kara is interested in who called and what did he say? He's interested in content. He'd be interested in who called, then depending on who it was, would tend on how important what he said was, right? As a rule. Uh, So that's the Hebrew word. But again, the emphasis is on the content of the message. Whereas the Greek kaleo, the the Greek K-A-L-E-O, places emphasis on the intent of the message of the invitation call. In other words, this is interested in why he called and what do you think he wanted? It's, it's after motive or intent or reasoning. Not so much what he said, but what was behind what he said. <laughs> it's kind of like talking to a wife. Do you know what I mean? So, so, so there, is, there is, in the Hebrew, there's interest in the contents of it. And in the Greek. Now, what is interesting is when Jesus comes along, he's going to put both of these ideas together when he's going to talk about this. He's going to pull both of these together in a very most interesting way. So when you're, when you're reading this and, for example, the Gospels, while you're still under the Old Covenant, when these words are being brought out, they're brought, being brought out in a much broader way and not just one way. So that's kind of interesting. I mean, when he's talking to the Hebrew person, he's talking to them under a kara idea, but he's using kaleo in his conversation. And so you always look for that because you're going to get all of that. And so this word uh, under the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, becomes a very interesting concept. And, And I'll show it in a little while. Both the content and intent, uh, of this, of the idea of called, are both 
are both contained in the divine invitational call, which always sent RSVP, right? Always. And an RSVP expects a dated response, right? As a rule, the, the, it, without a rule, I mean, it expect, expects you to call. And usually there's a dated response. I want you to call by such and such a time and date, right? And, 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 and this is exactly what this means when you put these two together. Uh, even, in the, even if you separate those ideas, and you're talking about Kara, Kara had it. If you put it Kale, K -K Kaleo, you would have the same idea. So that's very important that you understand that. Now, here's what's interesting. You take Hebrews 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 8. And, it said, and, he, and he, they use the word call with Abraham. Okay? And, and, and they're making an application to those under the new covenant. Right? He's not talking to people of the old covenant. He's talking to people of the new covenant in Hebrews 11. So it says, by faith Abraham, when he was called, that's kaleo, when he was called, it's a present passive participle, when he was called. In other words, there's the content of a message. We would call that directive will of God that was laid out. The directive will of God was laid out to him. In other words, I want you to go to a, a far land and that, uh, because I got, I, I got a mission for you. And but that's all he told them. There's not a whole lot to go on. I mean, that's not that's not like, well, am I coming back or how many how many clothes should I take? Right? Wouldn't that be a question? I mean, how many how many pair of underwear? I can only wear this a couple of days and then they get scratchy. So, I mean, <laughs> what are we going to do with this? See, so I. I it, so what's interesting, listen to what he says. He says, when he was called and obeyed, that's hupakul, when, uh, hupakul. And hupakul is really interesting because when we look at the faith cycle, you know, the hearing, believing, applying, completing. When you look at that, hupakul is really interesting because hupakul, hupakul, the reason they call it obey, it means that you, you are under authority and akul means to hear under authority, and the authority is telling you to listen because something has to be done. So the word, this hupokul, means to hear something, to listen to a message, the, con the content of a message, to understand what the motive and the intent is, what is what required of you. Uh, listen, don't come back. Don't come back without the prize idea and it means to hear under authority that has delivered the the message the content of the message and the, the intent of the message that you've got both those it means to understand that understand it and be now willing to obey it until it's completed are you with me that's exactly what Jesus did in the garden of Gethsemane And this word, to listen under authority, is translated obey. In other words, they went from hearing to believing to applying in order to get to the completion of the mission. Jesus did it in the Garden of Gethsemane when he saluted and said, listen, I will do your will. I will do it. And, and he goes and does it, completes the mission. It's just kind of interesting that Romans ten seventeen is part of that. We start always with Romans seventeen and the faith cycle. Faith comes by hearing, then we that then hearing comes to understand and that comes to believe and believing comes to it walking by faith and not by sight. And so the, all of that's really, really important because he, this is interesting Greek language when they call it obey, which takes you all the way to application. Now being a in the military, you understood that right away. When they put you in formation and gave you a command, laid that thing out, you understood that uh, there would be no break until it was done <laughs> or whatever. Uh, there would be no supper or whatever. So anyhow, but it, it's a command. It's a very strong command word, hupakuo. Um, and, and listen, 
listen, what's attached to him? Now, here's what's important. I want you to remember these attachments. Here's the word called. And obeyed. Right? And here's what's important about that. What's important about that whole idea is, I, I wrote it here, positive response, a positive response and commitment to the directive will of God, called and obeyed. Now, he's going to tell you what he was called and what he obeyed. Here's what he says. He was called and obeyed by going out to a place watch this now, where he was to receive for an inheritance, here's obey. And he went out not knowing where he was going. This takes obedience to another level because to get from point A to point B, which is just a short distance down the road, a day or so journey. I've got to believe and obey that I'm following somebody. Right? <laughs> Come on now. He's following somebody. And that's the Lord. And he's going to take him from this rock to that tree, tell him to rest, and I'll tell you where we're going after we get up. And he's going to make him go that whole journey until he gets him to the promised land and says, welcome home. Now, here's the point. This is the way God wants us to live, and he put the Holy Spirit inside us who guides us. When Jesus came for his disciples, here was his big word. Here was his early word. Not, not his only one, but here's the first words that he gave us in marching orders. He said, follow me. Right? Follow me and I will do such and such. Follow, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And as a result of that early call and that doctrinal principle... Everybody that followed Christ were called what? The followers of Christ. They were all called the followers of Christ. And then the, the names began to switch based on what was going on. Then they're called the way and then they're called Christians and there it goes. But originally that doctrinal concept was come follow me. And that come follow me he didn't tell them where they're going or what they're going to do. He said, come follow me. And they, listen, these guys understood this principle. They left everything and followed him. They left everything and followed him. <clears throat> not knowing, listen, it's not knowing where, it's knowing who you're following. why you're following. He says to Abraham, I want you to go from here to a place that I will show you. And there you will find an eternal inheritance. See? You know, that's the carrot, right? Some of us got to have a carrot. We give me the carrot and I'll follow you anywhere. Just put the carrot out in front of me. That's the carrot. And listen, God understands the human nature of man. He understands that. And so you be, I'm not going to tell you, where, where are we going? Where are we going? How, how long are we going? You're going to be going a long time, I can tell you that. I'll tell you every day where we're going. Because i got to teach you a lot before we ever get there. And so it is, people. So it is. Jesus said in John, the 10th chapter, Jesus said, and I love this because as a pastor, a shepherd, this is important. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. If that shepherd is following Christ, those sheep are in good shape. But when that shepherd stopped following Christ and they're still following the shepherd, they're going to fall in a ditch. 
So it's always important for the sheep to know that the shepherd's following the Lord and they're following the shepherd because this is a shepherd deal. The shepherd is the under shepherd of the chief shepherd in in 1 Peter 5. Because I can't tell you how many people I've seen follow the guy to stop being a Christian, a Christ shepherd, and they followed him, and they all fell into the muck and mire. So it's important. Don't follow just anybody. My sheep hear my voice, and you know why? Because there's the shepherd that feeds them, cares for them, takes care of them, and nurtures them, right? You know, as an old farmer, not an old farmer, but as a young farmer, I tell you, there's one thing you can't get any animal to do for you if you abuse them and that's follow you. Do you abuse that animal very much? You can forget that that thing. And uh, you got to learn how to handle young ones especially because they'll kick the fire out of you. Every time you step behind them, I don't care how much you do until you gain gain their trust back. Feed, nurture, take care of them, and not stop beating them. And, and, you know, the Bible shows that. You remember Balaam? Remember the donkey kept trying to save him, and he every time the donkey saved him, he beat him. And donkey said, look, I'm through with this deal. The next time, you're on your own. Right? Uh, we all need a talking donkey sometimes. But anyhow, follow me. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. Uh You know, it's about who more than about what. Um, here, here's the second point about about this. I just found that interesting in Hebrews 11. The second point that I find it important is where this is actually used under the old covenant to show you, to bring you into the new covenant. Jesus did it in Matthew 22 in a parable. So if you go to that parable in Matthew 22, put your eyes on it. Matthew 22. Um, there's a parable. Uh, And and it's a very famous parable of the wedding, the wedding feast. Uh, King is the parable is a king is uh, giving a wedding for a son. And um, there are three parts to this parable. There are three parts to this parable. The, The first part is one through eight. So when we read it, the first part is one through eight. This is the first invitation. Because of a negative response, there's a second invitation given. That's verses 9 through 13. And then the doctrinal principle, a parable always has a doctrinal principle, is verse 14. So let's take a look at this. Now, the, so, so we'd be able to say, Jesus answered uh, from a, a resp- uh, listen, which is really interested this too, because I don't want to do that right now, but he's just told a similar parable. So he's put two parables back to back telling the same thing with the same doctrinal principle. In chapter 21, he gave the parable of the tenant. I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but here's mine. Uh, He spoke to them again in a parable, spoke to them again in a parable. It's another pair. It's a similar, it's a parallel parable, (laughs) parallel parable. Um, the kingdom of heaven, this is what how we always did this stuff, is compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Now, the other parable would be, be really helpful because that son, uh, he, the, the king is God and the son is Jesus. But, and he sent out his slaves or his servants to call those who have been invited to the wedding feast. This would be the prophets. And... Um, they were unwilling to come. Now watch. There's a negative response. In the first invitation, pay attention to the negative responses. There's one, right? <clears throat> Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who have been invited, they have received the invitation, RSVP, and haven't responded. Goes out, they say, well, I, I'm not coming. I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to do that. This is the king. <laughs> Okay, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, uh, and my fatted livestock, all are butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. 
Look at verse 5, negative response. They paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. Verse 6, the rest seized the servants and mistreated them and killed them. Boy, that's not wanting to go bad, isn't it? But I won't invite none of those people to my party. The king, remember this is a parable, the king was enraged and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set the city on fire. Boy, is listen, you know when that's going to happen to this group of people of Israelites? 70 AD. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Why? Reject, 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 and then took their rejection even further. Persecuted those who had been sent to just tell them, it's ready, all you got to do is come. They mistreated them even unto death, right? Now we got verse 9. So there, there's the first section. Now we got a new section. 9 through 13. Go therefore to the main highway, highways, uh, you know, that'd be 59, 20, 459. Old 78, maybe, if you remember old 78. Go, therefore, to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite them to the wedding feast. Wow. See, the first group was selected. The second one was private. The second one was public. Now, you know that second one is? Ussens? Ussens? Listen, we're the whosoever. Is that not the whosoever? There they are. Go out, go out into the public and invite anybody who wants to come, comes. That's us. What a day. What a day we live in. And those slaves, servants, went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. And when the king came in and looked over the dinner guest, watch this now, he saw there a man not dressed in wedding clothes. Now, here's about the wedding clothes. They were all prepared for them. They were grace. Just go out in the streets and get people to come. But once you come, you've got to be properly prepared. This is a king's celebration. And so there was a, a wardrobe with all sizes, you know. But you had to, you had to go through and have your wedding. In other words, there's some protocol. And you better have that protocol but th because you're going before the king. But it didn't cost you a thing. And listen, when you left, you could wear them. You didn't have to give them back and put on your street clothes. You got a whole new set of clothes. I mean, first, first, I mean, you know, big time stuff. Maybe only wear them because maybe the only time you ever got to go to a king's d d shindig, right? But that'd be something to hang up for your kids to know, wouldn't that? When the king came in, looked over the dinner guest, he saw there was a man, a man not dressed in wedding, wedding clothes. You understand now? This war rope, there was no reason not to be. It was protocol to, once you got there, to be properly dressed to be presented to the king, king in that portion. And he said to them, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? In other words, who do I need to hold responsible? Is it the, was it the servant at the door that said, step over here and, and step into the, what do they call that in the, in the stores when you go to try out clothes? Dressing rooms. Step, step in a dress. Say, I would never do that. I would never put a picture. When I heard, when I saw people doing that, I went, I'm not buying those on the rack. <laughs> so I don't do much shopping. I didn't buy that. I don't know who's been in that room with them clothes on. I ain't buying those clothes. Unless you dry clean them, I ain't buying them. I don't know. This, we, we all have quirks. That's mine. And, and so he said, listen, I need to know who to hold accountable because this is unacceptable. <coughs> and so he said, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And he was speechless. And the king said to the servant, bind him 
hand and foot, cast him into outer darkness. In that place, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay? I mean, you've got to come in here under protocol. All right? Now listen to the doctrinal point. Here's verse 14. For many are called, but few chosen. We started with this idea of called, invitational call, right? That's how we started this whole deal here, an invitational call. In verse 3, and he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast. Here we are in verse 14. We've gone through this whole thing. Some were called. They said, no, I, I'm not going to go. Others were called. Nah, 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 nah. Then some got absolutely brutal over it, right? I told you not even come around. I'm going to punch you up. Then you come back here again. Listen, I got to get, are you coming or not? <laughs> I think that had been kind of clear, wouldn't it? Well, anyhow, but it winds up, many are called, few are chosen. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Many are called, few are chosen. So it's really important when you look at this parable, remember it has one doctrinal point, but it has many ideas. What we're after in the word called is the idea of the content of the message and the intent. Did you see the intent? They rejected, they rejected, they rejected. They said, look, go out and give the message to to whosoever will. But there's protocol on that too. And what he's talking to, what he's talking about in this parable is the Israelites, isn't he? He's talking about Israelites. He's talking about those Israelites, and yet here's a here is a, a fact that can be applied to all of us. And remember it when he's using this word call, he's using this word call in the full sense of the word. We're talking about the content. Do you understand the content of the message and and the intent? And the parable is going to give you more the intent. The 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 just the storyline gives you the content. Reading how they're responding and what's going on and how they're being dealt with shows you the intent of it. Of the, and it's all about call. I mean, verse three, this is a call. Verse fourteen gives you the doctrinal principle. It says it's very important that you see all that. Now, um, the word the word called is kaleo. Kaleo, we've talked about that. Um, and the word chosen is made up of two words, which is really interesting. The word chosen. It has ek on the front of it. I've just showed you the two words that it's made up of. Um, it in the in the Greek language, it's ek that l e t o s, but this t o s, but this letos. It comes from, the root is lego, which which means to say or to make a point, to say something or to make a point, and it and the emphasis here is to, to point some to, to, to make a point. And the, and so you're pointing out something. This word chosen is really interesting word. Many are chosen. Um, how does he say that? He says for many are called, but few chosen, but few are chosen. There are many were called, but only a few, only a few actually attended. Many called, well, listen, this is so important. Now, a lot of people are called, right? The first half was pr- private invitations. Everybody went. Pfft. Then we went to the highway and the hedges. And it was all about whether they would respond or not in a positive way. If they responded negative, then they weren't. Let's say many were called, said no, 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 no. They rejected. Few were chosen, right? In other words, it went according to the protocol and and so it, it what we're dealing with not just the content but the but the motive or intent which is it's just kind of interesting because many are called 
you have a choice. And this parable was about that. You can accept the invitation of grace or you can reject it. You can accept or reject. That's volitional. This V is upside down. We should have put it the other way. It, it's So in this story, if you want to see, you, you hear the message, what is, it, what is it about? Well, the king, king, the parable, the king is giving a wedding for his son. It's a big deal. He is the heir to the kingdom. It's a big deal. It's his only son. It's his heir. It's the firstborn, whatever, however you want to view it. And it's very important you come. And they all rejected it. Uh, but those who did, a few, a few, right, compared to the many, you know, a few can only be compared to the many. Uh, Ronnie, how many eggs did you get from the chicken coop? Well, if it's a few, it, less than I got yesterday last week. And so, you know, it's just, it's a comparative thing. A, a few compared to the many that had it put to them. Listen, isn't that true in your life? Think how many people you share the gospel with, and they go like, nah, 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 nah. And the few that come in the kingdom, but it's the few that come in the kingdom that they give you the joy of the journey, right? And you have to be careful. You don't just get worn out and, and everything about that because the majority is going to refuse it. It's the few you're after, right? It's just the few. Compared, but listen, remember, few is compared to the many. <laughs> Always compared to the, and so it, it's important when you want to see, we know the message, but if you want to see the intent of the message, you have to pay attention to the inner working of the parable on the word called. And it's also interesting how the king responds, is, right? Uh, the king is not without responding to it. He gives everybody a fair chance to sink the ship. Then he goes like, well, okay, here you go. And you see the king involved on both times, don't you? The king was very much engaged in this. And so that's important. When you look at the parable, which is really important, and I didn't, you know, time limited, don't give me a chance to talk about the parable that, that introduced this parable, but it's the parable called the parable of the tenant. And I put it on your paper. And in this parable, they actually kill the son. The heir of the of the of the uh, inheritance, they actually kill him. Not only that, but they dra they dra dr they drug him, they dragged him. I had him drugged, and uh, I went, "What am I doing here?" They dragged him out of the vineyard, out of his father's vineyard, and murdered him. In the either you know, probably that's parables more, probably more well known than the wedding one, um, and killed him. Uh, and in that parable, it's pretty much the same way. He sent uh, the father sent servants, uh, you know, to you know the, you've harvest, you need to pay the rent, and that's why they're tenants. And and uh, they beat the servants, they killed them, and they stoned them. And then they, he sends the son, and he says, certainly they will respect him. If they respect me, they'll respect him. And they went, I'm both of you. That ain't going to work. I mean, there's one thing. Listen, boy, you, you pick on a lot of people. You don't want to pick on God. And so that parable is a, is, a, is a very good parable compared to this one. You put them both together, you got some pretty powerful information. What is also interested is the word church in the Greek language. I put it on your paper. See at the bottom of your paper? Ekklesia. See that ek? See, that means out right here. Pointed out, picked out, pointed out. And ekklesia is the, word, is a, is the, noun, form, noun, the noun form of the word called. And the ekklesia, the church, are those who have been called, uh, the ones called out. In our parables, it would be those chosen, which is the same words connected. The church of Jesus Christ means those who have been called out. Called out of what? Called out of the world, right? Called out of Adam, called out of whatever, uh, called out. 
In Acts, the 20th chapter 28, when it talks about Jesus purchased the church, the ecclesia, the only way you can come out of the kingdom of darkness, the only way you can come out of the kingdom of the darkness of the world is through Jesus Christ. He offers his blood, and it's only through the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ can you come out. So that's Acts 20, 28, into the church. The only way you can come out of the world and into the church is through Jesus Christ. He dies on the cross for your sin. He's buried. He's raised from the dead the third day, not only to bring you out of the darkness. Listen, that's Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He, is, he has rescued me from the kingdom of darkness and transferred it into the kingdom of light and the kingdom of Christ or the church. We're called out. The church are those who have been called out. That's Acts 26, 18. It's a powerful, this is a whole powerful idea. E Ephesians, the fourth chapter, four through six, talks about it. Talks about the, every time you see this word church, listen, listen. That's why the church assembles it locally. That's why it assembles. These are the ones that have been called out for assembly. In the Old Testament, they called, instead of calling it the church, they called it the assembly. The assembly. It is still the assembly, the calling out of God. According to Romans eleven twenty six. the calling of God is irrevocable. Think about that. Irrevocable. Don't you love that idea? Irrevocable. Here's point three. The old covenant believer had to recommit his faith every year looking to the historical coming of Christ for Christ to fulfill shadow Christology. You can read this in Hebrews 10, which we will in a, some, some time or another. Um, that was year by year. D done much like I said, and the Eucharist with us, like in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty, In Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 9 and 10, he says, Behold, I have come to do your will. This, this, this is... This is what Jesus is after. Behold, I've come to do your will. Not mine, right? Well, that's a famous line. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. Now watch this. Here could be a gate question. By this will. Now listen to me. Uh, let me see if you're going to sleep on me. What, what, what is that? By this will. What is that? Huh? Well, what is that? The will of God's a pretty big picture. He broke it down and gave it smaller to you. Crucifixion. Why are you guessing? Don't, don't guess. Don't guess. Because it's in your text. Don't guess. Don't guess. I mean, you're all right, but you're in general terms. Look what he said. No, look, no, look, see, sometimes we read the Bible, don't read it. That's my point. Here's what he says. I have come to do your what? Now he's going to tell you what it is. What's, what's he tell you it is? To, to take away the first in order to establish second. Are you with me? Yes. By this will. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He said, I've come to do your will. And then he tells us doctrinally what that was. To take away the first, what? Take away the first covenant. See, we're in, we're in Hebrews. He's established this principle in chapters 8, 9, and 10. We're in chapter 10 in that verse. To take away the first covenant in order to do what? To establish the what? Second. The second covenant. That's called, that's the old covenant. That's the new covenant. What do you do with the first covenant? Don't guess. <laughs> okay. What do you do with the first covenant? Took it away. Who took it away? The father took it away when Jesus Christ established the point he could take it away. He dies on the cross. It's now the blood of Christ 
that is fulfilling all of that Old Testament shadow Christology. He takes away the first in order to what? To establish the second. What do you do with the first one? Boy, if I could get the church to understand it, the church of Jesus Christ in the world would have a revival like you've never seen. But most of the church of Christianity doesn't believe this passage because they don't practice it by faith. They don't practice it. And a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. Jesus Christ died on that cross, put his blood on the line for God's will to take away the first to establish the second. What is the second? He tells you. He tells you what the second is. By this will, taking away the first and establishing the second. Greed? Yes. By this will, taking away the first and establish the second, we have, we church age believers, we under, under new covenant, we have been sanctified, set apart unto the holiness of God through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How often? Once for all, under shadow Christology, it was year by year. Not anymore. Boom, done. The old is out. It's not. Well, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if I'm saved. Well, I was last year, but I don't know about this year. Why? Well, I haven't been living for Jesus. Did you get saved by him? Yeah. Well, then let me sit down and tell you where you went wrong on this. It's not that you need to be saved again. You need to understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You need to understand how to stop sinning in your life. Quit walking in the flesh, start walking in the spirit. I mean, it's not brain surgery. We could do it maybe on you, but it, it, probably somebody will do it if you keep doing what you're doing. By this will, we have been set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all unto the holiness of God. Therefore, it comes back to our passage, how much more with the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works. Dead works is gone, man. You need to understand that and serve a living God. This new covenant in my blood, he, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Matthew five seventeen. Do not think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. This is everybody reads the first half and said, that's why I keep the law. No, you need to read the second half. The second half said, I did not come to abolish. I came to fulfill it, to take away the first and establish the second. I earned the right because I fulfill the old and in the I am the fulfillment of the second. That's how that thing works. Or in Romans 10, 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. It's not about works. I love this one. Remember the two guys on the road to Emmaus on the day of the resurrection. That story is always powerful to me because it occurred after the resur on the very day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Lord shows up walking with these guys towards dinner time. They're on the road having this big discussion. They're in there. He, he joins them. They don't, they don't know he's there. And they go, oh, uh, stranger. Um, and they have this conversation. He said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Now, he's talking about when he, when he was up and mobile and living, you know, without, before he died and was buried and raised from the dead. Doesn't mean he's not alive today. But while I was still with you, before I went to the crucifixion with burial and resurrection, three days ago, you know, the three-day three, three day business. While I was still with you, that all things, listen to what he said, that all things which are written about me in the law of the Moses, the prophet, and the Psalms. You know what that is? That's the entire Old Covenant. That's the enti entire Old Testament. You know, Old Testament is Old Covenant. That's the entire, that's, that they broke the Old Testament into three sections in the Hebrew Bible. That they are. That's the entire shoot match. Listen to what he said. All these things that are written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. 
And who's going to do that? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to do it. He did it while he was here, and now he's at the right hand of God the Father, sitting in authority doing it, clocking it out. Point four, the called of God are those who, who have responded by faith to the gospel of grace salvation, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, or as I say, I put it on the board, I put the cross, his burial and his resurrection. He dies on a cross for your sin according to the scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. He is buried and raised from the dead according to the scripture, and that's called the gospel. That's called the gospel. That's what the gospel is. When, when you fulfill Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. For by grace we're saved through faith and not of ourselves as a gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 2.13 and 14. We should always give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you. There's that word chosen. God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and faith in the truth. For it was for this reason or it is for this that he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter 5.10 the God of all grace who calls you to his eternal glory in Christ. The God of all grace has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. Or 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen race, a holy priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellency of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 2 Timothy 2, 9 who saved us and called us with a holy calling sanctification, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, divine plan and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from the eternal life conference. Powerful idea, people. Let's close in a word of prayer and then we'll have our our church prayer time. Our Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and by the internet. We pray, Father, that those who are with us by internet all over the world, all over the United States, would gather themselves on Tuesday night to study with us or whenever this is able to be broadcast and they can pick it up. Stay with us in this study of Hebrews. You can pick up the other previous lessons off our internet, doctrinalstudies.com. I pray tonight, Father, that we would come to understand that we are called of God Every person who has responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ has received 20 status privileges. One of those is called of God. What a privilege it is to be identified as the called of God, the chosen, the beloved. And so the list goes on. We're thankful for that because it's all by grace. We got it by grace and it's kept to us by grace. It's not earned. It's not kept by earning. There's no merit except in the grace of God. We're thankful for that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.